Good afternoon, everyone. It is David Schlothauer here with a very detailed Atlantic hurricane season forecast for 2023. Some of you were asking if I was going to make one of these hurricane forecasts, and so here it is. But before we do get started, let's take a look at today's sponsor. I am incredibly excited to announce that I'm officially an affiliate with TriologyMaps.com. The link will be in the description and the pinned comment below. Triology Maps has created the highest definition and the most customizable digital maps you can find anywhere online at a highly affordable price. These maps are so customizable due to a very unique and innovative layering system that makes it possible to create whatever map you like. Making weather maps that look incredibly professional has never been this easy before. So if you want the highest definition, the most customizable, and the most professional looking weather maps that you can make up for a very affordable price, go ahead and check out TriologyMaps.com. Again, also be sure to use my 20% off discount code by going to TriologyMaps.com and then entering the code DAVE before finalizing your purchase. Okay now, let's take a look at our NOAA Coral Reef Watch sea surface temperatures that are right now being displayed on your screen and this shows us how warm those water temperatures actually are. These are not anomalies by any means at all and so we can see in the Atlantic it is definitely warmer than average. Already the 26 degree isotherm which is needed for tropical storms or hurricanes is already inching its way closer to Florida and is already in the southern portion of the state including for the Gulf of Mexico that has appreciable warm sea surface temperatures. Why this is important now because when we get closer into the hurricane season we're going to start seeing these really warm up. And the fact that they are already about a couple of degrees Celsius above normal is quite concerning. And we will show you that here right now in the next um, PowerPoint slide. So NOAA Coral Reef Watch uh, sea surface temperature anomalies are pretty kind of not so pretty depending on how you look at it. Sea surface temperatures are above average across the Iberian Peninsula. This really warm horseshoe shape that you can see here really illustrates of classic seasons that usually have very busy hurricanes and they're usually strong. So with that being said, we have a similar output of that. The very warm uh, positive um, um, NAO, we call it, um, with this warm horseshoe shape with sea surface temperatures that are about one and a half to two to even almost three Celsius above the long term average. So, definitely a warm one, not cold by any means at all. We are seeing near average sea surface temperatures in the central Atlantic. But uh, overall, it is definitely quite warm, especially for the southwestern Atlantic into the Gulf of Mexico, into the Caribbean, also for the main development region and across the eastern Atlantic Basin. Very warm. And this is going to matter a lot when we get closer and closer to June 1st, when we get into climatology speaking, when the Atlantic hurricane season officially arrives. So the NOAA Coral Reef Watch um, sea surface temperature change here indicates um, did water temperatures warm up? Did they cool down within the last couple of weeks? And of course, they have warmed up here across the main development region, including for the west coast there of Africa that have warmed up already about a half a degree to almost two Celsius warmer than it was two weeks ago. So some pretty dramatic warming. It has cooled off quite a bit over the Gulf of Mexico and much of the central and western Atlantic right off the eastern seaboard there. Sea surface temperatures have cooled roughly about a degree Celsius per two weeks uh, versus over the deep tropics here that have warmed up pretty quickly. And that's because of the pattern that we're in. Weak trade winds here have really correspond to some of the warmer sea surface temperatures. Now, another um, product that I like looking at is the upper ocean heat content. And we're gonna compare four separate years on the exact same day. This is April 27th, back in 2020. And we can see, I'm gonna just kinda uh, highlight in white here of different years. So the white line, really corresponds to the 2020 April 27th. 
and we're going to compare different years here. Let's go into year 2021 uh, on April the 27th, and that's going to be in yellow. And when we see that, you can see some of the upper ocean heat content not as aggressive as it was in 2020 um, in its base. Let's go to 2022. We're going to use orange and a little bit to the north here in some quadrants of the Gulf of Mexico. Um, further south here and less in the way of upper ocean heat content. That was last year, by the way. It's last year at this time. All right, but now let's take a look at what we have for this year. We can see much ahead of schedule here in some portions of the Atlantic, the upper ocean heat content furthest north than it was in 2020. It is right on par uh, with um, the year 2020 in some regards uh, with the white line there. Little ahead of normal there across um, portions of eastern Florida. It's about the same or so in some degree over the Gulf of Mexico. A little bit further north here, actually, uh, with that warm nose, um, that kind of that loop current that is a little stronger this season. Why is this important? Because if we're running ahead of normal with upper ocean heat content, that just means our numbers might get higher before they get lower, right? What that might mean? could mean more activity in the main development region. Probably not so much in the Caribbean. That's because of El Nino, which we won't get into today because we did an update on Monday on that. In fact, if you want to know more about that, there will be a card on the top of the screen here where you can click on that and watch my latest El Nino video. I would highly recommend checking that out because it kind of gives us an idea with what El Nino conditions are like at this given time. So El Nino will influence what the Atlantic does here. But either way you put it, we're already running a little bit ahead of normal in 2020, 21, and 22 in an overall sense. All right, another thing that has happened, and it's been pretty active, is the Madden-Julian Oscillation. It's been out of its null phase for quite some time. We can see on the European model where the MJO has been. In simple terms, this is where there's a lot of upward motion, lesser wind shear, lesser trade winds, more west wind anomalies that usually augment vorticity in the lower levels of the atmosphere and these help kickstart tropical cyclones so we can see that usually when it ends up in this basin uh phases two which is here three and four that usually favors the atlantic so from right about here all the way over to here favors now you're probably wondering well wait david there's no tropical cyclones and the mjo is already in our favorable phase it's because it's april we're not supposed to have any tropical storms or hurricanes in april this usually matters a lot by the time we go into june and july and especially in august and september usually when climatological speaking the atlantic hurricane season is very very busy so we can see here it is going to be staying out of the null phase for quite some time all the way through the entire forecast with some members that do indicate that the MJO could go way out here away from the null phase. That would be a very strong reflection of the MJO if that occurs. The GFS pretty similar too, going to stay out of the null phase likely according to its ensembles with its members going pretty extreme here all the way out to possibly a uh, positive three on the index in phases five and six. That would be a pretty strong reflection of um, some upward motion over Africa, perhaps, that can give way to maybe some tropical development. But of course, it is too early in the season for that. But again, if this was like, say, August or September, this would matter quite a bit. All right, another way we can see the MJO is the velocity potential anomaly. If there's any upward motion, if there's any sinking motion, so upward motion is usually in green and blue. If there's sinking motion, it's usually in orange and red. Okay, so all these red colors really delicate to sinking motion in the atmosphere. While look at all the um, kind of the in, the kind of the enhanced convective phase over Africa, over the Central Atlantic. So if you kind of follow me closely here. 
it's kind of it's this box so if you box that we can see right here in particular from about may 11th Okay, so this is in the future. This is now. This is May 11th, May 16th, May 21st, May 26th, the 1st of June, the 6th of June, the 11th of June. Okay, and we can see in time, a lot of this upward motion could develop over the Atlantic Basin. And if that happens, we could get some activity going here by late May, maybe in the tropical Atlantic. We've got to see and wait if that actually happens. But I'm very sure we're going to have an early start to the Atlantic hurricane season because we're not quite in a strong El Nino state. We're in a neutral state. And I think there's going to be enough impetus here where we might get something. Maybe one or two named storms in May doesn't surprise me with more probably in June. Just got to wait and see, right? So now let's take a look at the climate forecasting system version 2 model this is a very good model that i like to use and it really illustrates where of uh, the precipitation will be above or below average so below average precipitation for that given region is in yellow kind of the brown and red colors down here above average precipitation anomalies are usually in green and dark green and even teal blue colors so we can see here by May 2023, we do have an early start to the West African monsoon. That's typically what usually leads to tropical formation and tropical waves coming off of Africa. But look at this, below average likely um, that is anticipated for much of the deep tropics for May 2023. But once we get into June and July, Look at all this above average precipitation. This usually means we have more tropical activity, usually above normal, right? That's going to contribute to above average rainfall for this region, according to the climate forecasting system. And again, this is very far out. Okay, I want you all to understand that this is not a set in stone forecast. So just because you see this does not mean that, oh, we're going to have a very busy July. Oh my gosh, we're going to have a very busy June. This kind of illustrates guidance that we are going to have at least some tropical activity that we are going to have to track closely by the time we go into june july and even perhaps into august okay and you can see above average but it is interesting to see that there might be below average activity coming off of africa by september during the peak of hurricane season which could put a lid on things um but otherwise um, definitely slightly above average is what my forecast is calling for. Other forecasts do agree with that. And therefore, why don't we check, take a look at my Atlantic hurricane season 2023 predictions. All right, so we can see TSR stands for tropical cyclone risk. That's an agency, a few, one of a few that we're looking at here. They predict 12 named storms, six hurricanes, and two major hurricanes. I don't have the ACE score up here because that could vary quite a bit from forecast to forecast. Um, the University of Arizona stands for UA on the agency category. They do predict a very, very active season. I do not believe that at all. But that's their call. They predict 19 named storms, 9 hurricanes, and 5 major hurricanes. And then um, South Carolina, yeah, South Carolina University predicts uh, 13 named storms, 6 hurricanes, and 5 major hurricanes. While the Weather Channel predicts 15 named storms, 7 hurricanes, and 3 major hurricanes. North Carolina State University predicts. Um, forecasts 11 to 15 named storms, 6 to 8 hurricanes, and 2 to 3 major hurricanes. And everyone wants to know, what about my forecast? I'm the DSCFS. So um, David Schlotthauer, Climate Forecasting System, I, again, because I agree with the um, CFS in some degree, I do predict 9 to 13 named storms. So generally a below average season that I am forecasting, I'm being pretty generous at this point just because we are there's still the client um the spring predictability barrier is getting in our way we'll have to really wait and see how el nino does pan out so that's why i'm on the lower end of the forecast at this given time okay i do predict though four to eight hurricanes and two to four major hurricanes and when it comes to the um did I put two on there? Uh-oh. I put a two of them. I do not know why I did. 
I'm so sorry about that. You guys get to see two extra forecasts. But however, David Schlotthauer, her um, high in some or yeah, high in forecast is what that stands for. So again, David Schlotthauer, high in forecast or HEF for short. I do, uh, that high end forecast or a control model forecast calls for 12 to 18 named storms, 6 to 10 hurricanes, and 3 to 6 major hurricanes. That's again on the high end of the scale. That's probably not going to pan out, but there's always a model spread that we have to look at, and that's what I do forecast. All right, well, that is going to sum it up for today's video. If you did enjoy the video and the forecast discussion on the Atlantic hurricane season forecast, make sure you drop your comments in the section below this video. Smash the like button if you did like today's video. And also, don't forget to subscribe and check out um, TrilogyMaps.com. There is a sponsor at the beginning of each video. I highly encourage you all to check out those maps and purchase them for a reduced price. That's going to do it in this video. I am David Schlotthauer, and I'll be back with you more tomorrow.